Hi, I'm Jim Hinch with Guidepost Magazine. Today's conversation is with Deborah and David Beto, Christian ministers who've had their lives changed by addiction. Listen as they share how they walked the road to recovery with hope, faith, and prayer. We met when we were about 19. But a very mature 19. (laughs) And uh, we were both pretty good kids, you know, rule followers. So our school had rules about drinking and dancing and smoking, and we didn't do any of that. (laughs) Yeah, and addiction, I would say, was nowhere on my radar at all. I believed that if you um, stayed away from those things, those vices, you would never have that sort of a problem, like addiction. So neither of you knew anyone struggling with addiction. Yeah, I I didn't even really know much about it. I had had a great-grandfather who had been an alcoholic, and we knew about addiction, but only in context of you were had victory. So we heard stories of people who used to be, but now were really good people. No one that was a good person and an addict, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and I'd say that, you know, there's this, I guess, the Christian culture that we were in, the idea that... If you have right theology, it will lead to right living. Um, That absolutely was, that was part of what I believed, and I think both of us did. So it didn't even seem like it was something that was possible. As long as you stayed away from the bad stuff, it wasn't possible for you, um, as long as you believed all the right things, to get caught up in something like that. When did things start to fall apart? At work, I had kind of was foundering a little bit but I stumbled kind of backwards into teaching and loved that so you know things yeah continued to kind of work out for us and again um, well maybe not work out well okay yeah (laughs) no I mean exactly what do you mean I mean um because your migraines had that's true yeah no that was that was a huge damper on this like newlywed life of him starting out with so much pain and and living with pain and, you know, where our friends who were getting married were thinking about careers and buying houses and all of that, we were kind of stuck for a while in, mm, yeah. and actually for a long time, we were stuck in this pain and trying to figure out what was wrong with Dave, why was he getting migraines all the time, and what were we doing in our life that was causing this pain you know was it food was it diet was uh, you know was it stress was Was it it, sin was it a sin that he had that needed to get rid of and so so there was always from the beginning you know would go along for a little while without a migraine then migraine would hit and then he'd have to have pain medication and it just it would start a cycle and um so those early years while we were you know, so happy and excited to be together, we also had this pain issue going on that really caused us a lot of um, kind of confusion and doubt about what we were doing, where we were headed. You know, it was just, it was confusing to have to deal with that much pain that that early in our marriage, I think. Mm -hmm. So painkillers for migraines became addictive. Yeah. Deb, what did you notice about Dave as he started to change from the man you first knew? There were things that I, signs that I didn't notice and that I only knew looking back, if that makes any sense. That in the end, when I really, really realized, you know, this is not going away, this is so much more than I can handle, was when it started to affect me and it had affected me but when I started to really recognize oh my goodness I have turned into this really angry person even after we realized yeah he has a little problem here the fact that it kept happening over and over yeah I think because of the foundation of not believing that this was a thing that could happen with Christians of the the, that blurry line with the pain medication of when was it necessary and when did it turn into addiction and when it finally got to that point where I was like wow this really is a serious problem he's not living up to the things that he's saying that he's going to do to fix his problem and I don't know what to do with this and in the middle of him being leading this ministry I hit a wall of anger and I saw that start to come out on my kids 
And that's when I realized, okay, I need help for me. Even if he doesn't recognize that he has a, hmm. a problem that needs help, I need help for me dealing with that. You were angry with him, angry at this life you didn't sign up for. Yes. So that was this revelation of peeling away my denial, basically, I guess. Yeah. At the point when we were in Washington, we'd moved to Washington, kind of getting away from Southern California and all that we thought, you know, maybe all of this crazy life and, and maybe that's you know, him, him being sick with migraines all the time. Maybe if we move to Washington, it'll be fixed. Because <laughs> it was maybe, California's fault. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe if we move to Washington, you'll be fixed. Maybe Dave saying, you know, I think God is calling me to seminary. And so I'm thinking, okay, Tacoma, great. And then after we were there for a while, you know, his, his addiction problem didn't go away. And we started getting bills, and it was all for doctors and medications and stuff. And I just thought, you know what, he's just being really irresponsible here. And I blamed it on that because I still had this idea in my head that he needed the medication for his migraines, but he could control it. So while I'm in the middle of this, you know, idea and really frustrated with him um, and angry about the situation and trying to figure out what to do with my irresponsible husband... Then this episode of Oprah airs, and the guest is talking about the same kinds of problems that I was seeing in my husband. And then the reveal, the big reveal was, oh, addicted to pain medication. And I just was shocked. I thought that the pain medication that he was on was not addictive. And why by this point, with as much as we had gone through, I would still believe that about that medication? I don't know. When I realized you know, I should probably actually check this medication, and I did, and turns out that it actually was addictive. So I confront him and tell him, hey, you're addicted to pain medication. Um, You should probably fix that. Kind of still believing that if he just acknowledged the problem and confessed that it was a problem. And just stop taking pills. Yeah, and have some accountability, he'd be great. And of course, it wasn't that easy. He couldn't, quote, fix it in time to save his job. So when he came to you with the news that he'd been fired for stealing from the Christian camp where he worked and where your family lived, how did you handle that? Um, Well, I was completely devastated and shocked because for that last year, um, both of us had been going to a recovery group. And I thought that he was getting better. He also, in that time, um, had a relapse that I knew about, that his boss knew about, and that he did a brief inpatient stint in there and came out with the replacement drug to help people get clean. And so I thought, well, we've tried everything else. It seemed like it was working. And I thought, you know, for seven months, I'm thinking, this is fantastic. And I did not know that it actually wasn't and that he had gone back to taking pills. And so it was a, not just a double whammy, it was multiple things. It was being hit with all that I had believed for the last seven months about his recovery was suddenly a lie. And then this feeling of hopelessness of, okay, what do we do now? Because it's not just a job loss. We've lost our home too. Oh, and we've also lost this ministry that we loved. So it's just, it was so many levels of pain all hitting at once. And then it was November and we're looking at Christmas and having little kids and, you know, what do we do now? And to, you know, to that point, our families had been pretty supportive. And while they didn't know every time that he had relapsed, they knew about the big ones and um, had been really supportive of us and had even bailed us out of debt a couple of times by this point. And so my fear too of, my goodness, we've also burned through all the support that our families can give us. What are they going to say now? And I shut down. How'd you make the choice to stay? I, I also asked myself that because I believed for several years and that if it ever came to that point where it ruined our lives again 
because it had previously. I thought if, if he ever does that to me again, if it ever reaches that point again, I'm leaving. When that actually happened, actually my, after the being stunned and hitting that point of, of pain, my thought was, he made this mess, he's going to fix it. And a lot of people have the story of maybe the addiction, there was also violence or abuse associated with it, but he wasn't like that at all. Being with dad wasn't any danger to my kids. And I thought, well, if I walk away from this, I'm the bad guy here because they can't, to my kids, because they don't see the person that I see. And I'm thankful to God that that was, that actually was his rock bottom. And I didn't have to go to that choice again and find myself at that point again. But I do believe that if he had not picked up the pieces, I would have had to make that choice. Obviously, you couldn't overcome the addiction alone. Where did help come from? Because of where we were, that we were involved in a Christian ministry, um, there was a little bit from that, a little bit from the church that we were attending, a little bit from our Christian family, um, and then from other Christians in the community that we knew through other places. So there was this big, bigger help. Oh, and then our recovery group. And then there was our local church. The church community around us, like Deb said, not just our own local church, but believers around us, our families, of course, were ridiculously supportive. I'm going to tell one quick story. I remember one day we were driving home, and it was, this is still raw. I mean, it's we were still living at the camp. They'd let us stay for a few weeks, which was really generous. And I was still thinking people were going to hate me. And as we pulled up, we were driving home from church, I think, and on our doorstep was a black plastic trash bag. And I was like, somebody is so mean that they threw their trash on our door. So angry at you. So angry at me. And I, we pull up and open it, and it's trash bags full of wrapped gifts for the kids. And I, the thing that I dreaded was being the recipient of help. I'm supposed to be the helper, not the, not the helpee. And then they, had, they helped us again, and then a third time they helped us which went beyond their normal, they have this, you know, at the time for helping people, helping families, they had a cap on the dollar amount and how often in a year a family could receive help. And they had to go through all these, jump through all these hoops to be able to do more for us, which they were great, and they did. They, you know, they, they made exceptions to their own policy, had to have the board vote on it. And, but I'll be honest, in the middle of that, it was pretty embarrassing. And one of the things when I came into being a pastor was like, we're changing that rule. Um, the deacons, the people who were in charge of that fund were in unanimous, like, you know what? If somebody needs help, we're not going to put an artificial cap on it. We're going to make it so they can maintain some dignity in the middle of that process and not, you know, we want to be good stewards of the money and and help that we offer so there will be accountability and we'll make sure it's spent on the right things, but we're not going to make them jump through a bunch of hoops. Um, You know, some of those, so that kind of stuff to me, giving somebody dignity and I think the biggest thing our church and pastor gave me was dignity and also you know what it wasn't just loving us and welcoming us into the church they still respected me and gave me worth even as I was admitting that stuff you've come a long way do you fear going back or are you confident in your recovery journey well I'll throw out for me yes I'm living the dream man (laughs) I am I can't believe I get a chance to do what I do. So I get to be in ministry. I get to work in a fantastic church with people I love, working with people on the fringe who've been hurt and who have problems. So on the one hand, I have a huge amount of hope. I I hope the future is more of that. I hope it's a chance to connect and have coffee with and celebrate, you know, a week clean and all that stuff that I just is fantastic. And I, I hope it just keeps on. And part of that is I know I am one pill away from being back in that place. And so I want to be clean. I want to be honest. I want to be safe. And I want to make sure I have help around me. And uh, so I want to not only keep my guard up, but also keep accountability and keep the confidence, just that same thing, that if it ever did happen, to be able to be in a place where I could share that um, and find the help I need. But, um, But I have huge hope for the future because... When I was using, I didn't imagine not using could be fun. 
and my life is so fantastic now. I mean, not everything's perfect, not everything's great all the time, but it's so much better, and the risk reward is is huge. So I look forward to huge hope to continue doing what I'm doing, and so there's both a carrot and a stick that keep me hopeful for the future. Yeah, I think that it took a lot of years to get past fear. And I I think, too, it was really important for us to have... We had six years away from full-time or vocational um, Christian ministry. Um, And for both of us, that was actually the only time in our whole lives (laughs) because we were raised in church, you know, and, and... our, both of our parents, both sets of parents were, that was their full-time calling was Christian ministry. And so those six years um, were so important for us, I think, to step away and heal. That strengthened us, I think, in a way, you know, just out of that and having that pressure removed so that we could heal I think working past that fear of what if this happens again, that was huge. And it took more than just me. <laughs> but the longer that he is has been clean and sober, I mean, celebrating 10 years was huge. I it, But we're not, you know, Dave will say it and he did, we're not under an illusion that the longer you're clean, that means you're invincible. <laughs> it's just knowing differently that a failure doesn't mean the end that a failure means, well, you have to pick yourself up again and just keep going. Mm -hmm. And I think that fear is powerful. Fear and shame are so powerful, not just for an addict, but also for people who are in their family. And being in a place where I can talk to people honestly about my fear, my fears, and where I've worked through some of those issues of shame I think that that is that has been probably the most powerful thing for me with um, in, within our church. Hmm. I think even the last few years of being connected with people and feeling like I'm connected with them to a point where I could be honest about some of these things, but it took time. <laughs>